everyone, this is part two of a deep dive into the character side of the Fantasy Companion for Savage Worlds tabletop RPG. That book has got a ton of material that makes it really easy and exciting to make a fantasy campaign. This part two talks about a number of edges that we didn't get to in part one. So if you really want to do deep dive and you want to look at all the aspects of it, go catch part one first. It's over an hour. Part two, over an hour. Lots of material. But if you want a deep dive, here, check it out. All right, well, now we're moving on to power edges. Power. <laughs> um, my favorite, my favorite. These ones are really interesting, and these have a couple of S tier. Um, we'll have to talk about that. S tiers. Yeah, S tiers, <laughs> which, you know. I have my little fixes. Um, well, I know you first, want to talk about the bat, Artificer. I know you want to talk about that. Well, not really. I mean, there's Artificer. It's it's um, one of the ones that is modified from the original one. Really, the only modification here is that the Artificer Edge allows you to do crafting for permanent um, items, which is not in normal suede. So if you want to create magic items using the fantasy book, then your that character has to have the Artificer Edge. So it still does the temporary stuff, but it just they added in the permanent stuff. Um, and then there's the Master Artificer, which basically makes it, um, you do it much quicker. So you, when you're making um, permanent items, uh, you do it much quicker. So that that's, we don't really need to talk much more about those. Yeah, yeah that's that's got its own section um, in the book. And another one yeah. that has its own section is Battle Magic, which is yeah. where you allow the character can now cast spells on units of extras, you know, soldiers, that sort of thing, in a in a kind of a large battle scenario which is really kind of cool and there's a whole section yeah. on battle magic how it's used um but i i like totally could see wanting one of my if i was doing a uh an arcane background that this would be an edge that uh -huh. i'd want to take at the veteran just because i think it's cool i don't know what you think about it no it is cool i mean yeah so i forgot to rate artificer but you can't i mean okay i mean I, master artificer i would say is if you're doing a lot of crafting, it's all right. But the name, I mean, obviously, if you want to make magic items, you need it. But yeah, sorry. Moving on to battle magic. Um, yeah, this just allows you to do the battle magic. And it's it's kind of funky where it's it's basically a modifier that gets added. It's a five-point modifier. And maybe we'll talk about this later, but it's a five-point modifier that, that's added that allows you to cast it on specific groups of units up to 500. So, like, they have to be the same type of unit. Um or enemy units too. Yeah, this is cool. Again, but this is one of like when I rate powers, this is similar where this is extremely setting or game dependent. Oh, sure. This is something that like, yeah, I love that they added in the whole battle magic section, but definitely talk about this with your game master is are there going to be, you know, large battles? And not just like one. I mean, we're talking about like multiples in the campaigns. Otherwise, it's not worth it. Like, you know what I mean? So yeah. If it's, it's a game that's like Kingmaker or something like that AP, then it's probably worth it where you have these like battles, you know, but uh, that, so this one is hard to rate because it's like, it's either, pr you know, an F basically <laughs> like, or it's like, you know, probably it could be a B or an A. I mean, just because like, if there's a lot of mass scale battles, the, the amount of influence that you can have over enemies and your allies is huge with this. So, yeah. Yep. I like it, even though it could be an F. There's just something I, I dig about it. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. Like, you just want to make sure you're going to actually get use out of it. Um, uh, so the next one is blood magic. This one is you need a, an evil disposition in the requirements, um, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. It's basically that you you channel power from giving pain to others, and the, functionally, it's whenever an arcane. A caster causes a wound to a quote unquote like conscious sapient being. So something that, you know, something that's living, right? Um, and the wound can't be soaked. So you actually have to cause a wound and it can't be soaked. They recover D6 power points. Um, and it's it's not even regulated to magic damage. You could be like a gish, like a, you know, spell blade that s swipes somebody with a sword and you would still get these uh, power points back. Um, but it doesn't work for summons like a zombie. It has to be you've directly caused damage. Um, and then they have a little section here about like um, th authorities will hunt you. Now, obviously, this is like extremely settingy de de dependent. Um, I do think it, it's definitely strong as far as PowerPoint recovery. I mean, if we look at um, what's the name of the edge that uh, uh, a channeling. 
right? Which we never vote that high where you get a raise, you get a PowerPoint back. Um, I probably see this one as more, I mean, it depends, right? If you have a lot of, if you're a gish or you have a lot of offensive spells, that's when you want to get this. If you have a lot of control spells or buff spells, then it's not going to help you, right? But if you're do, if you're focused on damage, you'll probably get more power points back from this than channeling. Um, yeah, I so, would agree. Yeah. yeah. But of course, then the ne there's the huge negative to it. Um, exactly. So, I so. mean, like, I could see that, like, somebody could say, oh, it doesn't have to be somebody who's evil. It could be somebody who's, like, has a, like, like a sorcerer whose bloodline is from an undead or something, or they're cursed, or they're, like, a dampier. Someone, like, there's, there could be an edgy thing that they have that's not necessarily, they themselves are evil. Um, so you could kind of take that away, that part. But I would still leave in the part about it, like, it being faux pas just because it, I mean, it's not that strong, so that's up to you. I mean, you could change it, right? I mean, I, oh, if yeah. somebody came to you and they wanted it, then you'd probably be open to it, right? Um, yeah, probably. I mean, it'd be you'd have to kind of work it within the narrative, and of course, you know, there there's a reason for this, and uh, have to be a balance. So, yep. I mean, so what do you rate that one? Again, so this one is if you have if if your powers are offensive based and if there are if you're like a gish and you just do damage a lot i would rate this as like a b otherwise if, if you just kind of have a couple of powers you know and you don't do damage all the time it's like then it's probably like a d and i would take channeling over it for sure because channeling will work with all powers so it, you really have to be like completely offensively focused for this to get its value i think yeah i, I agree um then the next one is epic mastery which is the the edge that unlocks the epic power modifiers for you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're to the point where this is a veteran. It requires veteran. So by that time, you have mastered your craft so well that you've you've opened up the epic power modifiers. And um, I don't know if we want to get into the those. I don't think so. Well, Just, we can talk about a little bit. I mean... Yeah, we're not going to talk about them. We'll talk about that when we get to like the powers. We can maybe go through and actually just talk about the epic mods themselves. But these were first. I think epic mods first showed up in rifts. I think. Um, yeah. But then obviously they were uh, the whole epic mastery and thing is is a pathfinder thing with with certain arcane um, certain class edge trees. Um, this one is. Uh, I mean, you know, I I love this. I love epic power mods. I mean, maybe it doesn't fit all games in normal suede. But if you know, but you're in a low magic setting. But I think for anything that have like medium or high, it's good to in include epic mods just because it gives a feeling of progression to, to powers. Because you can, you know, if you don't take that many new powers, you kind of just have the same powers your whole career. And some of the powers, like healing, have a lot of expensive mods that maybe unlock as you, you know, gain more power points um, for your time as a hero, hero or whatever. But you don't really get any other unlocks there. So this kind of gives a fun, like, oh, now I can do this extra thing. And, of course, a lot of staples of what you would think of as D&D &D powers or whatever, you know, common. What we think of as powers, like, you know, being able to have, like, a teleport gate, like a gate or whatever. Or just, just a lot of those kind of things that are only available with the Epic Mastery. So it's definitely for a more of a high magic setting, but yeah. uh, this is a easy A for me. I don't oh, think yeah. it's overpowered because the mods themselves are more expensive, but it, it's so, it's very satisfying to have this when you have arcane backgrounds, it really makes the powers cooler, I think. So, well, and I think um, yeah. it, it gives you this as a, again, as a, right now, the normal with powers is your progression as you're getting more and you're getting more power yeah. points, and it gives you something to look forward to when you hit that veteran, right? Because yeah. this is it's a goal out there to unlock this new tier for the all the powers that you have now, um, for those that have epic power modifiers. So, I think it's yeah, it's definitely an A for for casters for sure. I totally agree. Yeah, and and, and then the other the, the alternate way they could have done this because because it it fulfills that of having the like higher level spells. What you think of right? They could have just made separate powers that were like veteran or heroic. You know, like they made wish, which we'll talk about at a different time. <laughs> but like, I I still like this better that it's it's still it's still your powers themselves are growing. Um, and, and by you spending more power points, yeah. so yeah, A for me. Um, okay, uh, the next one, Familiar. Uh, so the, this version of Familiar was first introduced in Pathfinder. I'll go through the description really quickly. Um, but basically you get a small, quote-unquote, uh, animal that's minus two or minus three. And they are they have their own personality. And they'll do, you know, but they'll do pretty much what you want them to do. They probably won't kill themselves for you. 
Um, and they have some of their own like nature. So a cat might go after a mouse or something, whatever. Um, they're a wild card. So that's in regards to their wounds and they have a wild die, but they don't get their own bennies. Um, they can understand their master's speech and vice versa. And it's kind of like um, through telepathy, basically. But they're not like, you know, super intelligent. Um, they, they do get, they are, uh, uh, I, I think they, I thought, oh, I thought they might have an extra smarts, but it's not them. So they, 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 they basically are like what a dog might think of. Like you can kind of talk between them. Like um, the other main thing that they have is they have five power points on their own that recharge separately. So the mage can draw from those power points as they were their own. So when you take familiar, you basically get extra five power points and they recharge separately. So if you are, if both you and your familiar, if you spent five power points and your familiar spent five power points and you rest for an hour, then you would get back five power points and your familiar would also get back five power points. Um, they don't advance, but every single rank, including novice, you can basically choose one of these options. Um, one of them is second sight, where you can look through um, within ten miles. You can look look through their senses. Um, you can you can give them uh, increase one of their trait dies, and it's only one one trait per. You know you can only do one trait period. So you can only bring up their smarts one time or their uh, notice one time, and then you can give them an enhancement, which is like basically you give them an edge, and it has to kind of make sense for their species. All right, if they die, uh, the hero is automatically stunned. And they can, you can summon summon another one or the same after 10 days. And you can change the type at that point. All right. So all of that. And we talked about this with Savage Pathfinder. Yeah. This is an S edge. This it's is, cool. Yeah. It's cool, but it's overpowered. Like, hands down. I mean, with one edge, you get, you know, familiars already have so much utility out of the win win So yeah, you just get, yeah. like, a small animal that can, you know, excellent scout. I mean, we all know about familiars, right? Um, with when you get the second sight ability, you can see through its eyes and it has a 10 mile range, which is crazy. So you have this excellent scout, you have this excellent flavor, this excellent role playing potential. It can do a lot of stuff, right? Out of combat. So it's not really a combat thing. The part for me where it gets, and then it gets autumn, it, it's a wild card, right? Sure. You can spend bennies on it. It doesn't get bennies of its own, but you can give it the luck edge, just FYI, unless your GM says you can't have it. Um, the part where then it be so it has all that other stuff going on, and then it has its own power points that recharge separately. So yeah, so you're when getting you double this the recharge. Just, yeah, you're getting double exactly. the recharge. Exactly. So when you yep. compare this to like the power points edge, that just gives you five power points. This gives you that, and it also gives you like a pseudo rapid recharge edge along with it, and it gives so it gives you basically these three things in one. That's extremely potent, and you know, like it, the utility, the the potency for the power points. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's too strong. Probably. And it's novice and it's novice and it's novice. Exactly. Um, and you know, PowerPoints are usually restricted to once per rank. So, uh, you know, th there's no reason you should ever take PowerPoints before you take this. This should be the first edge that you take. If you're able to take it, it has a, it has specific requirements for their arcane backgrounds, but it can be, you know, for a lot of different arcane backgrounds. So now what so, about, yeah, uh, I mean, what about a game master who's going to, spend all his time targeting the familiar. Yes, there's always that. But, you know, oftentimes, you know, you don't want to use it in combat. So keep it hidden away. Keep, you know, it, it can maybe do some scouting. Of course, if it dies, there's always, that's the one disadvantage that if it dies, you're stunned. But most people aren't using this in combat, right? Like they're not using it. But, so, but if you have one and you're going to be able to use it, um, I would think you'd almost, because the only downside is if the familiar dies. Yeah, I'd almost say, okay, well, you can keep them out of combat, but they have to be on the board in case. Yeah, so you could say that. That's true. But it could be hidden. It could be in your bag. It's a tiny animal, right? And most, most people, like, they want they love their familiars. They don't want to be targeted all the time. I think if it if it's being used in combat to support, because it can do all those things, too. It can, it can support. Yep. It yep. can test. It's probably not going to do any damage, but it can definitely support and test. So, again, it's really powerful, but that, then you're risking it, right? Um, but it can support in you know, dramatic tasks. It can support and chase it. Like, there's so much utility for it. Uh, the Like I said, I think that's a good fix, Carl. The other thing that I would definitely do as a game master is I would take it away its ability to recharge on its own. I would say it has five power points, but once they're used, they're gone until, like, quote-unquote, the next day or something. 
Or you could even take away the PowerPoints, but I think either of those are fine. It would, it's still a good enough edge on its own without the PowerPoints, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, but I think at the very least, give it, give it, get rid of the recharging part. Like sure. that's just yeah. too, it's just too strong in my opinion. So sorry, I, I talked a lot about it, but I have strong opinions. No, I, I think it's one of the most important yeah. edges in the fantasy companion. <laughs> so it's yeah. important to talk about it. It's it's what makes the uh, it's one of the things that that creates that high fantasy feel is having a familiar and and everything that goes with it um we yeah so okay yeah um, i definitely don't think you should get rid of it but i think like you said putting it on the board you know getting rid of its rechargeability will bring it down to an a or a b right it's still a good edge it's still an excellent thing to have and i love the flavor i would i wouldn't want to get rid of it but yeah oh i didn't say get rid of it no no it's no i was just perfect. saying if a gm is like ah screw it but like <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right, then the next one is Favorite Power, which is a season. Um, and this is all about a caster who spent so much time, you know, they got a spell that they just love to use and it's they just understand it. And so what that gives them is the ability to ignore two points of penalties. And it says in italics in the book, any penalties. So that includes map, multi-action, wounds, fatigue, um, you know, there's probably any, I mean, there's probably others that I'm not even thinking about, but there's a ton of, yeah, ton of utility in this one um, for a particular power. So I could see, you know, somebody who gets into, and it doesn't say, you know, that a power being used as a favorite power is considered a, um, uh, you know, a limited action. It's, no, it can be just a regular action. So you can yeah. really, decide to start gunning down if you've got if you're like uh like you talk about a gish right you're like all about attacking boy this would be a great to have a favored power in this and of course it would work for anything but i could just see that somebody now they become a two-gun kid kind of thing for um some one of their powers (laughs) that'd be kind of fun so um i think it's definitely useful Oh yeah, it's definitely. I mean, again, this is so. This was made in Pathfinder. That version had three set powers, and it was yeah. so you could choose three powers, but they were set, and it was a limited um, free action, like Carl said. Now I think that so they really went on the other end. They took away the limited part, which is not that big of a deal, honestly. Um, that's not that much of a deal breaker. It's the the going from three to one is a little harsh. Like my change for Pathfinder was two of any that you can pick, and then you can change them when you get new powers. But you could take this um, multiple times. Well, it doesn't, but that's the thing. It doesn't say that you can. Remember, edges have to say that oh, you that's can right. take it multiple times. I made that mistake once before, so, yep. yeah. So, so with this one, I, I definitely think allow it to be taken multiple times, uh, or you make it two powers um, of their choice that can be then, um, uh, that can be changed change when you take the new powers edge. Um, now with Pathfinder, because I, on its own, it's it, it's good, but it's like I mean, uh, I would say on its own right now, while it's good, it's not. I, I'm almost right this like a, I don't know with just one power and because because they added the hasty mod, which is what the main thing that you think of, which is better than the, it's cost two power points. Basically, the hasty mod is it costs two power points and it's a limited free action to cast the power, and that eliminates the multi action penalty for the power and anything else that you do. Right, this would only eliminate the multi action penalty for the power. So I, I, on its own right now, I would give it like a B maybe, or even a C. I would, I would up it a little bit personally, but what sorry, what were you going to say? No, I, I, I think that was the key I was coming to is um, if you could take it multiple times, that would, that would kind of change the dynamic. And in yeah. Pathfinder, one of the things in Pathfinder we hated was, or not hated is a strong word, but the three powers – a yeah. couple of them were the same no matter who you were or what you were doing. And they some of them weren't all that useful um, as part and, of the And it three. was set. So it's yeah, like it was set. It, so if you, you took pick. it and you didn't take those powers, you like didn't get any benefit from it. It was like you were forced to take those powers to get benefit of it. So, yeah, it was a little lame, I thought. But, yeah. So um, I like this one better. I guess you can say a B, I suppose. But, um, yeah, there's other ways of getting that kind of capability, I guess, like you're saying. So, okay. Yeah. I would say cool at, least co- allow, at least allow it to be taken more than once. Maybe you could do it like once per rank or something, right? Um, so, yeah. yeah, once per rank that would that would balance out really nicely. I think. Yeah. That's All right. Good. Here's a fun <laughs> Are you ready, one, Carl. Are yeah, you this ready, is Carl? a fun one. Okay, Mystic Powers. So 
Mystic Powers is their version of when when in their class edges for Pathfinder, this was stuff like when you think of half casters in D&D or quarter casters, whatever in Pathfinder, those kind of things. So things like Rangers, Paladins. Um, yeah, I mean, basically those, but um, it could also be, uh, I guess, monks with like Chi. Um, but okay, so what are Mystic Powers? They are a weird version of an arcane background. Um, you In this one, there's several, there's three, six packages that are basically classes. They have the Barbarian, Fighter, Monk, Paladin, Ranger, and Rogue. But you can make your own. They even talk about you can make your own. Um, but basically, the, the player chooses a package, and each of the packages has a specific um, prerequisite of a D8 of a certain skill or, attri or tr uh, attribute, a certain trait. Um, the character then gets, quote-unquote, ten dedicated power points, which doesn't really mean anything, the dedicated part. That's just That just means they get, they have this weird arcane background, they get 10 power points that recharge normally. As a limited free action, uh, they can audit, so sorry, when you take a package, you get a select, you get like three or four powers, specific powers, and that's it. So uh, you get 10 dedicated power points. As a limited free action, the person who has one of these mystic powers can automatically activate it for the normal cost as a success, or they can spend two more power points for a raise. And then they can use normal pot power modifiers for their normal cost. Um, Mystic, the, now these don't, these, aren't, these don't grant you any arcane background edges, but you can take the, they, they allow you to take the power points edge and the soul drain edge, and that's it. So the, only those two edges. Um, if they have a, if the, char the character has an arcane background, then none of them work. It's like any other arcane background. You can't use the same edges, you know, you can't use something that you get for one, uh, arcane background for the other one, but you still share the same power pool, even with Mystic Powers. Um, so when we look at some of these, like I don't want to go into every, oh. I mean, because again, you can customize them, but they're they usually give something like 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 the fighter has boost trait, fighting, shooting, strength, and vigor only. Um, so they'll have like a boost trait for most of these that are specific, and then a couple of other powers. Like Ranger has beast friend, boost trait, athletic shooting, and survival, entangle, and farsight. Um, and then a lot of them will have the personal limitation on them. Uh, the, the caveat here is that you don't get any benefits from the personal, the self only, right. the personal limitation. Right. You don't get you don't get a reduction in the cost. Also, you don't. I don't really think you get reductions in the aspect. So when you get like boost trait, agility, athletics, fighting, and spirit only, you're not getting a reduction in power points there either. No. Okay, I hope that all made sense. This is an S tier edge. Uh, this is cool. Yeah. Hands down. Hands down, this is so powerful. It's really powerful for pretty much any. You know, I always say arcane backgrounds is, is one of the most is one of the best edges, my favorite edge, and it's one of the best edges for anybody to take. And either when you have an arcane background, you either go all in, or you don't go that much in. You just take a couple of utility or buff powers that can be easily activated, and it just brings a lot to your character. This takes away the. I mean, this is just so powerful. I mean, honestly, obviously, it depends on what powers that you have, but like. You know, you look at the fighter, they get fighting, shooting, strength, vigor, they get protection, and they get smite. Uh, oh, those are all really good, right? Uh -huh. um, Barbarian gets speed. Uh, monk gets, monk doesn't get speed for some reason, but they get deflection. Um, Ranger gets entangle. These are super powerful powers, and entangle is really one of the best control powers in the game, and you're just automatically doing them. So, and this is really good for a caster to take. Like, they, they allow you to take that with the caster. So, like, you know, a, a caster who takes one of this, it's just really powerful that you can do some of these powers. Like, you just automatically do them. And then you get it as a free action automatically. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I think these are so powerful. I Really be careful as a game master. Unless it makes sense. Like, in your game, we have flavored this as little devices. Right, right. And in, in my sci-fi game. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a stronger game. Uh, it's a stronger setting anyways, but still, I, I mean, so yeah, there's all of that. Uh, I don't know if you want to hear my fixes first. Or you want to talk about it at all now that I've finished my long time. Well, well one but, of the things yeah. to keep in mind is, again, you can tailor this. Um, so it yeah. gives you this, it gives you the these basic classes, which of course, Fantasy Companion has a section that we talked a little bit about before, which allows you to kind of make classes by picking certain edges and things like that. So I would think from a game master standpoint, you would want to go through this and say, you know, what, what are the kind, what is this, the arch, archetype that you're trying to create? And yeah. you can see that it's basically 
Um, almost everybody has boost trait for a set of traits that are specific to that kind of class. And, yeah. and then a few other um, powers that are kind of, what would the term I'm look, uh, I would look for? Um, that, are, that are thematic quintessential. to the archetype. That yeah, kind of quintessential yeah. to the yeah. concept of, of that kind of character. Um, so yeah. I, it wouldn't be that hard to, to build it out and you know, tweak it to, to make it more balanced if you feel like it's unbalanced. But go ahead. I know you've got some tweaks uh, on this one. Yeah, I mean, uh, I like the packages that they have. Like I, I mean, like I said, some of them are standouts, right? Speed, deflection, and entangle to me are the biggest, uh, the biggest standouts here by far. I mean, those are extremely powerful powers. The, the changes here I would do, um, and you could do one or both of these, but at the very least, you could pop the power points down to five power points. Um, uh, I mean, it, th that makes it so at least they have to, you know, they have to take the PowerPoint's edge to get it up. They, they'd always be kind of a little bit behind. Right. The and they have to make some choices, casters. some hard choices then. Exactly. And they can't just spam these things. Uh, the other, th the other thing that I would do is make it a action to do these because they've added the, um, hasty mod modifier that the gish or whatever could still do that. They just have to spend the two extra power points, right? Cause they're giving you these powers that automatically activate and they're making it as a free action, which just is like, I mean, obviously that, that's what you want. For all, most of these characters, power is not, is not usually their main thing. So, but the, because of there's, there's the existence of the hasty mod, I don't think you necessarily have to do, um, you have to give them the free action for free. So I think either of those is probably a good, just to kind of bring it down to a level. You could even do both if you want to do it, go harder on it, but that would then make it really expensive for them to do it. So I would probably choose one of those to do. Um, so yeah, that, that's my fix just to kind of break it down. Otherwise I, I do think it's too strong. Like, you know, it's up there with the familiar. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, um, that and familiar are uh, mystic powers and familiar are two of the, almost you could, you're crazy not to take them in a sense. Yeah. So. And as a game master, when I say S, I mean that it's too strong. I mean that it's like, it gives you too much. It gives the player too much in my opinion. And obviously Savage Worlds is not about perfect balance, but you know, when, when one edge does three things or one edge does, like, basically makes casters feel like, okay, what's the point? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it just, it's just, they're just too strong. So, um, um yeah. All right. Um, then next we have one of the most important edges <laughs> ever in the Fantasy Companion, and it's that true. is Silent Caster. Oh. The, char <laughs> the characters learned how to cast spells um, without speaking. Woo. Now that I means, know. of course, within a silent spell, you can you can do it. But I, uh, the, pro, the pro, this is probably important in certain settings or certain you know games yeah. where the game master is really going to use it. But I played D and D for so many years, I don't think I ever was. It's like, oh yeah, that had a, oh that did have a some a, a, a verbal component. Oops, I guess I never really thought about that. We've just been playing, so we forget about verbal and semantic yeah. and or somatic and. Um, even half the time, the the, um, the the items you need. But then there's another hindrance that require in this that we talked about that requires items. That yeah. is kind of uh, goofy as well. So anyway, but a lot of talk about something that's not that big of a deal. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, like it's funny because they don't actually really you know there's no somatic component. Like there's it, they talk a little bit about that, but like you know, they're just assuming that like you have to speak to do a power. I mean, I, I, let me, let me say this though. I like it though. I love the flavor of it. I really, really do. I think it's a cool edge. Like you said, it, it definitely, it can be depending on the narrative. Like if you're in a seafaring aqua a game and you are taking arcane background, then probably this is for me, this is probably like a B or even uh, maybe even an A, but probably like a B if this is an aquatic campaign, right? It's something that you'd be like, well, I can go in the water and cast powers. Or I can hide underwater and cast whatever. You get a lot more use out of it, but obviously it's extremely niche. So th this is AC. Um, I don't even know if we're, like I wouldn't even call this. This even almost could be a D, depending. But I, I think the flavor is cool enough that I give it a C. Um, but you're really, it's really probably not going to get much use out of it. Um, but when you do, like when that one time that you're gagged, this is one of those things that we've talked about, Carl. When your player takes Silent Caster, you know. Ha Give them a give them a time when they're like tied up and gagged, <laughs> so right. they can then use this. Right? You want it? This is one of those edges that like the player takes this. You have to create scenarios, not all the time, but uh, you know. Yeah, but the hard part is if they took this, this is a novice, right? So they took this. They're yeah. hoping 
I mean, how many times, oh, look, the party got picked up and everybody's gagged. Oh, look, there's another guy <laughs> who cast silence spell. Oh, yeah. oh, got pushed into water yet again. <laughs> it's like, at some point, it's like, you can't keep playing to this, this one individual no. strength. So yeah. within reason, right? Within yeah. reason. But um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Finally, um, closing it out, we have transfer, which basically as a limited free action, a character may transfer up to five power points to anybody else in sight. This is a weird one, but um, uh, I mean, yeah, there's no basically no requirements. It's just novice and arcane background. Uh, I mean, this, it's cool. This, this is I, the I, throw me a magazine for arcane backgrounds. Can you throw me a magazine? <laughs> yeah, it, it's weird to me because it's like, I mean, if, if you have a big power pool, if you start with an arcane background that has a lot, I, I see this as very limited, very, very limited. I mean, you know, we can spend bennies to get power points back. Um if you're that kind of character who likes supporting people. But the thing is, like, if you are playing that and you have an arcane background, you're probably playing the character that has, like, the, you know, healing and buff spell powers, right? So, like, you probably. probably it's probably better to support people that way. I don't really know when you'd ever, like, oh, I really, I really, really, really need to give my friend power points. Like, they need it for some reason because, you know, it doesn't... I don't know when you'd really ever need to give them power points that you can... You know what I'm saying? Like, they have the one power that's going to that's going to fix whatever's happening or whatever. I, I don't know. <laughs> Besides just being like a selfless person, I, I don't, I don't really see that much value in this. So personally, I would give it a C. I do like it's there though. I like the flavor. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, people could always short too. So it's not like it, there's always a way around it. That's all I'm saying. What, yeah, what is your yeah. thought on this? No, I, I, I think the same thing. It's, um, it's interesting from a flavor standpoint. It, also depends on having, you know, maybe this is a good thing to line up with um, mystic powers where you decrease the number of power points. And so, you know, at, in, the, in the middle of combat, the fighters used up all of his power points. You know, you decreased them from the 10 to 5. And now yeah. the, the, the guy who's got the big pool, the mage, can start throwing some power points his way That's or true. something. So yeah. there might be some value in that kind of setup, but it really needs to yeah. have multiple people with arcane backgrounds in the, in your party enough to make it useful. It's, you know, like you said, if you really have an arcane background and you chose it and you have a big power pool and you have like shorting and you have the ability to, um, you know, have those modifiers, like for something that's self only, why are you throwing PowerPoints back and forth at each other? Uh, you know, it, it, maybe it's useful, but it's, it's probably not as useful as you'd like. But anyway, it's, it's, it's definitely something I wouldn't take a novice. Like I would wait till like, okay, I have a big point full of powers, you know, and we get the flow of combat. I probably would never take this at novice or even season. But yeah, it's definitely definitely not a something you'd want at novice. It almost feels like, <laughs> hey, I I've, I've I need something now to do a little different. Like so one of my friends has just one of the other party members has just picked an arcane background. Okay, I can help out with that. You know, now that we're going against tougher stuff, yeah. and we're going to use up all our power points quick. I don't know. Maybe. So, okay. Uh, professional edges. Uh, ooh. Uh, first one, ooh. <laughs> we start with we start with Born in the Saddle, which is um, kind of how it sounds. You are you know how to use a, or ride a horse um, or an exotic mount, it says in the rules. Um, so if you get this edge, you get a free roll on your riding rolls. And in Roll on your writing rolls. Did I say something yeah. wrong? Yeah. You said just roll. I don't, yeah. Yeah. I'm writing just, rolls and increases the mount's pace by two. Um, and they're running die by one step, which that is kind of cool um, as far as, you know, helping with the mount. Um, yeah. But, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it gives you that, that, that free reroll on writing can be pretty important if you're doing a lot of, uh, things where you're mounted, you know, chases or, um, you know, even uh, be interesting for if you were doing jousting or you're trying to do something interesting like that um, and you were doing like a dramatic task related to jousting or something, that would be kind of cool. Uh, so free reroll yeah. on riding would be nice. It's a setting. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah I, I, uh, I, I think also here um, the main thing that, I mean, yeah, like you said, it could be good for in chases. If you're doing a lot of chase, like it could be very setting dependent. But if your character is a mounted character, which can be a powerful option, um, it's it's still not that strong. I mean, the, the probably main reason you get out of the rerolls for is like if you're falling, if you get so if you get shaken 
or stunned or wounded while you're on your while you're mounted, um, or your mount goes down, then you have to make a riding roll, right? Um, or you you actually suffer damage and fall off. So so uh, really, that's probably the main value that you're getting out of this is for the, that that whole thing. Um, the the increase the pace is pretty cool. I'd still I still would have liked to see some more here, like maybe like you can you know. You can try, you know, you can take the hit from your mount that, like, if somebody targeted your mount, like, you could into, like, you know, get in the way and, like, you could, it could target you instead or things like, like, an edge that I've made up, um, which I call, I think I call Trick Rider in, like, my Fallout game and a lot of other games that I do where you can, like, things like dodge or improve dodge, if you have them also apply to your mount. So I, I wish it had a little bit more utility. I would say that, obviously, if it's a heavy game with involving mounts or you know knights and um uh this is probably like a b but otherwise it's probably i mean if you're a mounted character you're probably going to want to take this but it's still it's still kind of on the weak side i would say um but you know i, I guess I have to, if you're a mounted character i guess it's a b i mean there's there's still a lot of other stuff that i would you could still take but there's not much that gives you know there's a lot of edges that give stuff to mounts so what are you going to do, right? Fair enough. Like can't be choosers? Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, uh, okay, so coming up next is Explorer. This is the... There's two... There's kind of three of these edges that have to do with traveling, kind of. There's two, but I, I consider another one. Um, this one is when you're doing your, the travel rules, which often involves... Which, again, so this is a very, very, very campaign, or I would say, like the type of game that your game master runs, right? This is a very, not setting, but like uh, game specific. Like if they like u utilizing travel or the setting itself uses a lot of travel and you, the game, the game master uses travel rules. So again, before you take this, hit up your game master, be like, are you going to do travel rules? Um, so when this happens, the, uh, um, basically that there's, uh, when like you go to a different hex, you, you the, the game master pulls a card, and that can be like a good you know a, a ruin or a treasure chest or a monster encounter. It's basically the randomized encounters. Um, this one basically is kind of like level headed, where you you choose an extra one, and then you can choose which one you want to keep, um, and then it reduces your travel time. So this one's hard to rate. Um, I would say it's better than the other one. So if, if you're in a heavy travel game. Um, then I, I think this one's actually pretty good. I, I like the, the you know, if getting somewhere quick enough and you have a lot of random encounters, then I would give this one a B. Otherwise, if it only happens, a, a, you know, a little bit in your game, then this is probably not worth it. Maybe a D even. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Because you, do you ever use yeah. travel rules in your games? or Not very often. Of course, I'm bad at interludes too. I hardly ever use interludes and I should use those more often. But no, I don't use travel um, Generally, travel is a barrier to getting to something interesting, <laughs> more than yeah. more than a thing of itself. So, so uh, yeah, so yeah, this is the better of those. So, if you want to take one of like the traveling edges, this one is my opinion is better, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. But yeah, it's you really have to be ask your GM. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, as a GM, it's like okay, now I really should use the travel rules, and maybe this would be great for <laughs> maybe this would be great for a hex crawl if you're doing some hex crawling kind of yeah. game. That would be. That might be useful for that, for sure. Um, and that would put it up a little higher. Um, so, okay. Uh, the next one we have is Knight, which is a lot, which is a edge that's got a lot to unpack in it. Um, so this is, you are, you pledge your, pledge yourself to your Lord, you're serving them. Um, a whole bunch of stuff comes with that. You know, you, uh, you, you can have room and board, free lodging. You have some, you know, oversight of the min or the minions, the peasants, <laughs> <laughs> um, and and things like that. And then there's a mechanical advantage where um, intimidation and persuasion rolls within the uh, area of of your liege. You know, they're, they're um, where they have authority. You can get a plus one on those rolls. Um, what's interesting about it is. Uh, you do, as a requirement, it requires strength of D8, vigor of D8, fighting of D8, and it, but it's a novice. So it's really an interesting one to try to more get. More than that. Wait, you're, you're, you're missing three more. Oh, riding three D6. Ones. Yeah, yeah. And spirit D6. Yeah. <laughs> and obligation major. So that's a whole heap of uh, requirements. Yeah, but you were saying that the trait requirements are really high. 
right? Yeah, yeah, for something that's a novice. And yeah. it says it says in the book, you know, if your character, if you're during doing this during character creation, I'm going, wow, I'm looking at this, going, well, that's that's quite a lot of work. To, can you even get there during character creation? Quite, you, you know, could, you yeah, definitely yeah. could. Um, You'd and have then to it go says, all like, if, in. This is an all in. Yeah, edge. it's an all in. And then it says like, if taken during character creation, the hero inherits was granted a war horse, lance, long sword, a full suit of heavy armor, and a medium shield. Yeah. So okay, this obviously is a flavor edge. The only mechanical. Because again, that 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 whole end section, the whole end section there is with your GM's approval. You can get this stuff. Well, okay, it's pretty. You know, that's always with the GM's <laughs> approval. The only mechanical <laughs> edges you can get plus one to intimidation and persuasion um, with those who respect or fear authority. So that that's the only kind of mechanical thing that's actually in here. I don't like this edge, and I'll explain why. I I, I understand the flavor here, but like. It, exactly like the obligation hindrance to serve your lord would already kind of set you up as a knight. I mean, this is just like, do you really need this to do these things? Like, if if it's a game where this is, you're like, okay, I come from this nobility, like, and we're going to be in the near the lands, right? You're not like a wandering knight from like a, a, a different realm, right? You're this is like this is assuming that you have like that you're granted these privileges because you're in that land. So I just don't even see it like. This is something that's not needed. Like we, if I wanted to be a knight, right, in your game and you like, okay, we're in this area and I'm like, I'll take the obligation and you'll, you know, I have to like do these things. Like you make me work for that hindrance. Like a lot of these things you would just let me do anyways, right? Like if I'm like coming into my lands, I would get free lodging. <laughs> or, you're, uh, or you're even role playing would, it out, right? A little bit, you know, just yeah, for fun. Yeah, we would role play this out. Right. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like the whole thing with like a war horse, heavy armor, like you could just take the rich edge that does the same thing. Like the rich edge gives you a, an income and gives you way more money that you can then buy this stuff. So I, I really don't see why this is needed. Like it already is there with like us just making our games. It's one of those like weird things in certain games where it's like, it makes you think, okay, so I couldn't have been a knight without this edge. Like, I don't, I don't know. And they like, well, and yes. the amount of requirements that you need is like silly. Like, why do you need that much strength? Yeah. Knight is like, a, knight is a role you play, not a, yeah. Not, not. These are professional edges, but I think of knight as more of a role than a. It's a job, <laughs> more yeah. than more than anything else. So it's a job, it's responsibility, and like maybe. So if this was like, you know, you can wear heavy armor on a horse, and you get this benefits when you use a leg. Like if it had more mechanical things, would be like, oh, that's cool. Like you're you're in like the knightly style of combat. You're heavy cavalry. If it like leaned into that, I would think it was cool. Otherwise, I'm just like. You can already do this with your role playing, your background, and other edges can already do this and more, you know. And it doesn't that doesn't even really give you much. So I don't know. That that's I guess my take on it. Why I don't really like it, but um, I just don't see a need for it. I guess you know. Yeah, I, I. It's like I said. There's a lot to unpack here, and there's a lot you don't get a lot for your money. I I would say the <laughs> no. amount of investment that you have to make because this is an all in all in edge at character creation. Yeah. You're, you're investing everything into this to be able to get to this edge um, and take it. So, okay. All right. Uh, moving on, we have the Mount Edge, Thinking of Knights, which is a novice, and you only need a writing of D6. Now, here's what I'm going to say. This is almost, this This could be an S-ranked edge, but let's talk about it. So you get oh, a, okay. um, uh, they talk about, you get basically an animal, an animal companion, okay? Um, and if it's normal size, they can have a riding horse, a war horse, or an elder horse, or even something, you know, with a GM's permission. Smaller heroes can get a boar, a large cat, a dire wolf, or a wolf. Okay, a dire wolf. That's pretty cool, right? That's um, pretty awesome. Other mounts yeah. may be available, right? So it's like, it could be, it just has to be something that's like, it, they don't really talk about what you can't really, I mean, they talk about, obviously, here's some examples, but like, what would make it uh, acceptable to have this at novice? So you get that, you get that animal. And whatever it is, it's smart dies increased by one, and it's resilient automatically. So already this is better than Animal Companion, but we'll talk about that. And then for each of your current creature, for each of your rank, you automatically get one of these uh, effects, just like a familiar. So mm -hmm. you automatically can increase one of its trait types, no more than once per trait, just like the familiar. Just like it. Or yeah. it can gain an edge, just like the familiar, or a monstrous, monstrous ability that makes sense for its ability. Yeah. Which has some cool things, as, again, for your GM's um, requirements. Uh, now, death. If the mount perishes, another takes its place eventually, perhaps after a native encounter or, you know, you tame something or you buy it. Okay. Now you think, oh, that's it. No, 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 no. There's more automatic scaling here. At 
uh, at heroic rank with great mount, you can choose to keep it um, and advance it normally, which just means like the normal kind of advances, like we talked about the traits, or you can get dismiss it for a new one, um, which is they say here, okay, normal sized heroes can now have a bear, a dinosaur, like an herbivore or a pterosaur. Elephant, giant animal like a bird, a centipede, a scorpion, a toad, griffin, hippogriff, pegasus, saber-toothed tiger, unicorn, a wyvern. Small heroes can get a velociraptor or like a giant crab or lizard or a lion. Their smarts die is once again higher than normal and it becomes very resilient and it gains an advance for each of the rank, which is the same thing. You don't, you don't get double your advances. It's just saying if you took this at heroic. But this is at heroic. Now again, yeah, at so. legendary... You can choose to keep it or get a legendary mount. And now you can get stuff like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, a dragon, a young dragon, a drake, a mammoth, a tree, you know, a treant. A rock. <laughs> a a small rock. rock. You can have a cockatrice or a dragon hatchling or a hellhound. And now they're leg now it says again, the legendary mount smart is one dive type higher than normal. Now I do think, I, unlike what I said before, I think I was wrong. It just means it's increased one step. It's not like it's increased three steps. It just means you're taking a new animal and it's one step normal. And then the legendary mount because is a wild card. Is a wild card. And you get all of this for free, basically. Now, when we compare this, and this is my problem with it, Carl. When you compare it to the animal companion, so what does Beastmaster get you? Beastmaster gets you animals that normally attack you. You know, that's cool. It's pretty much flavor, but it can be useful sometimes. And you get an and you get an automatic you get a, a size zero animal. And it's just that's it, right? And then you can take it again to either take a new one or increase its size or increase its traits, but you have to take that edge over and over again. Here, you take this edge once and you'll end up, now in the Beastmaster, you can take it at heroic rank to make it a wild card. This this automatically does it at legendary, but these are like crazy, monstrous, you know, dragons and unicorns and all this crazy stuff, and it's all automatic. So. While the person who takes Beastmaster has to take it four, five, six times, you know, maybe, or even more to get the same stuff at, that you get for this one edge, right? Now, they don't talk about it, but I guess you could say, well, okay, if you have the mount animal, it can only be used as a riding mount. But they don't say, like, it can't be, it can't use its action to attack, it can't attack. Like, it doesn't talk about that at all. I mean, if we go to the, the mount rules, right, there's... Um, it just says there's nothing there. They're not dealt action cards. Animals may attack any threat to their front during their rider's action. So it gets an automatic attack with mounts. Yeah. So if we go by the mountain rules, they can attack. Now, can you get off your mount and can it attack? I don't see why, unless you as a game master is like, you have to stay on your mount. It doesn't do anything, which doesn't make that most sense. So, yeah. I, I don't know. Do you you getting what all I'm saying is why I think this is kind of overpowered. Um, sorry, I've talked a lot. But what's, no, what's no, your I, thoughts it, on this, this is a it's a, you get a a lot for an edge, like you said. Yeah. You know, it's it's almost like there was some um, when the fantasy companion there's a, what's it there's some grade grade inflation here. You know, they, they yeah. wanted to have some mount um, an edge that gets you a mount. You know, because you think about the paladin has a mount or the, you know, has his mount and it's been, then it, it's a little OP compared to somebody who wants to have, you know, who, who's using that other edge, Beastmaster edge. Um, so I, I agree. I agree. Now, the only thing is this has to be a mount animal and the game master could say, well, a dragon isn't a mount in my world. You know, you, a mount has to be something else. I mean, so you could, there's a cop out. Right, that, I guess that could be yeah. there. Right, like, so the whole thing is when you're when you're like when you get to the automatic points, it basically says you can have a dragon or a dra like you can have these crazy monstrous animals, not just a normal horse. Like, oh yeah, in the edge it's built built in. But yeah, I see. What you, yeah, I, of course, if the game master you can limit it. So yeah, this one is, you know, just because Beastmaster exists, this is just a million times better. I mean, there's no like that it automatically gives you all that stuff where Beastmaster doesn't is like so powerful, and that you can have like you know. Again, you don't have to do anything, and then your mount gets upgraded to a griffin or whatever, which is awesome. Like, I want a griffin. You pour That's all, really your, cool. your poor old mount. It's like, well, now go go away from me. I I no longer yeah. I no longer sure. want you. White fang your horse to then okay come to me. Do <laughs> you throw a rock at it? You know, so it runs off, and then it, it, it's it's a little silly that part because you you think you have this bond. So I mean, you know, somebody could just take this and just stick with their horse the whole time. I guess. 
uh, it would still be pretty strong, um, right? Yep. But their horse could be then like upgrading into a nightmare or whatever. Like you, you yeah, get yeah, monstrous yeah. abilities. Uh, here, I don't really know. Again, I don't know if it can be. You need the riding skill, but there's no, again, there's nothing here saying that you can't get off your animal and let it do its own thing. And even if you don't do that, it can still attack when you are riding around on it, right? It, it, that's in the mountain. So, so stay on your dragon. For free. So stay on your so, dragon. <laughs> so I mean. Yeah, you're still getting a lot of the the benefits of a, just a powerful and now the only kind of fix here I could think is you make this you you rename it to something like bonded companion or something and it needs the beastmaster edge as a prerequisite and basically you say you choose a single animal and then it gains all these benefits that the mount edge does but you have to take the beastmaster edge first right um or like whatever, like something like that. No, I think that it, makes a lot of sense. You, you have to, yeah. you just make it, just making you have a little bit of buy-in first. I mean, uh, but like maybe your character is like, doesn't have the Beastmaster thing where animals like them. So I, I don't really know. I don't really know, know what to do with this, honestly, just because like, you know, it, I, I imagine if I was like, I'm playing a druidy character and I take the Beastmaster edge and I'm like, I want a really cool animal companion that like, you know, that like I cast magic and it fights for me. And I put, Okay, I need to make it bigger. I need to make it stronger. Uh, I, I I put four. I put five edges worth of into it, and then here comes the dumb paladin with a riding of d6 or whatever, and takes this and has a a, a dragon <laughs> or whatever. A, 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 you know, at at but it's heroic, not legendary. They have a but it's, but it's right? at legendary. Yeah. So yeah, I mean. Yeah, so it's like, um, you know, that, that that like has all the that's that's bigger than your animal and, and is more powerful than your animals and is resilient, right? So. You know, I don't know. I it just thinks that it takes too much away from somebody who's like the flavor of the person who's like the beast companion. Um, so again, I, I'd have to think more about what I want to do with it. But I mean, I, I think it's cool. I think I like that there's someone here where you can get stuff like a griffin. But I, I just think this gives you too much. Yeah. So that's why I get again. It's a long diatribe about this, but that's an S rank. Okay. From me, like, would you allow somebody to to take this uh, in a fantasy game? Um. Uh, I, I don't know if I would honestly allow it. I mean, I would, you can have a mount, right? Every, anybody can have a mount and you can be really good at writing and you can, um, you know, do this stuff, but I'd have a hard time with this one unless it's very, the campaign's very specialized for this sort of thing. Cause like you said, it's, it's definitely overpowered and, you know, once you get the heroic, everybody's going to be going, well, now I want my bear. And you're going, well, I still want you to have a horror surge. <laughs> so, yeah. So, anyway, but okay. The, yeah. The, the only other thing I could think of is that like at heroic, you could then take this again to then get the greater mount. And then at legendary, you could take this again. So at the very least do that, I would think. Yeah, that that, um, that would, that makes sense. Yeah. Make it, make it so you have to buy in yet again. Um, yeah. But still, it's, even at that point, it's still an amazing amazing value overall so yeah it's still good but like you know beastmaster is probably well i really like beastmaster but it's probably a little weak on the weak side in a fantasy game um your animal companion is going to die really quickly with just its yeah. bear you know unless you take it a lot so anyways okay all right, let's let's move on so then let's go to poisoner <laughs> this yeah. hopefully there's not a lot to talk about here it's you're an expert well, at poisons um you can do poisons in half the time and you your contact poisons last 12 hours rather than four um, so there's okay. not a lot to it. <laughs> we just got to it. Uh, they've expanded poisons in the book. There's always not a lot of, you know, in the normal suede, it's just kind of like, well, here's the different types of poisons and they have more examples of poisons and then the time it takes. But honestly, creating poisons doesn't take that long. Um, and it, it's more about the money than anything. It's like half cost to make it. Um, but it only takes like an hour or something. I don't remember the specific, it doesn't take that long. Um, and the whole thing with contact poisons, it's only once you apply it. Like, why would you need it to last 12 hours rather than four? I mean, it's only when you hit something and then it's going to be, then it's used up. Right. Um, unless I'm getting something wrong, unless I remember something uh, wrong yeah, about I, poisons. I, it's, it, I, I just, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. It's not, it doesn't add a lot it's of not value. Good. I, yeah. I would just say it's not good. I, for me, I'd rather have something like you have a plus two on making poisons and it costs, it's, it's less money to make them. And maybe like you can apply poisons as a free action or something. I don't know. Um, it, I can't remember all the points. We'll, we'll talk about it when we when we actually talk about poisons in a later video. But I'll just say this is like a D. It just really doesn't do that much as far as 
when you want to make, it doesn't do that much when you're making poisons. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's keep uh, going. Yeah. Oh, I'm for that Okay. One. Scout. Uh, so this is the second of the edges um, that, that have to do with traveling. If somebody's using traveling rules in your game, basically this one is, um, it's kind of like the, uh, I forget what it's called, but we're like, uh, what's, what's that edge called in Savage Worlds where you can detect something if somebody's about to jump you? Um, I can't remember the name right now. But uh, anyways, oh, so um, the, yeah. the, the game master pulls a card and if it's a hazard of some sort or whatever, um, then you get a minus two uh, to notice to detect it first. So you basically, you, you kind of can, you're not going to get the drop on you or you're going to know what you're going into. And then they basically say scouts are always considered alert for notice rolls versus stealth. And they add um, plus two to common knowledge rolls to recall information about towns, outposts, landmarks, or layers along a particular route they may have traveled before. All right. So like I said, when it comes to pure mechanics of traveling, I think the other one did it better. Um, but, you know, this one has some cool, like the whole minus two to, to, to detect it first is, I mean, whatever. It's okay. But like, the scouts are always considered alert versus notice rolls for stealth. That's okay, right? It's not going to happen all the time that actual enemies sneak up on you and that you're not alert. I don't know when that would be, right? If somebody's sleeping, I guess, <laughs> right, Carl? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But that, but then the funny thing is that, that that's also the <coughs> there's or, there's already the edge for that is when you're undetected, when you're unaware. So you're probably not going to ha happen that much with that. The plus two to common knowledge rolls is a little cool, but it's, this is pretty niche. So even in a game, I would say that. Features travel heav heavily. I would give this a C. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Carl? I, I, I agree. I, I don't. I don't see this as hugely valuable. I mean, you get you get the the notice. Um, you know, you get that alert. But I don't know. I, and I'm not sure. You think plus two on common knowledge is interesting um, for towns and outposts and landmarks, but um, it's that another GM's call thing. Right. So, yeah. you know, oh, I want to roll common knowledge for this. And it's like, well, this is not something you've never been here. So you really shouldn't know. But OK, so now it's wasting the fact that somebody took this edge. Um, anyway, I, I don't think it's all that great, honestly. No. So um, then next right. comes stone cunning, not cutting, cunning. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this is for those who you spent your life, or you work with stone, you know, she's just know it inside and out. You know, you you are one with the rock, uh, with the stone. And, and this one gives you, um, if you can see or feel, um, which is kind of interesting. So here it says, if you can see or feel the work, you get one free notice roll at plus two, and that's to detect traps, hidden doors, or compartments in stonework within 10 feet of the person. So if you can see or feel it, so you that's within 10 feet of the person, I guess that would be C yeah. <laughs> within 10 feet of person. Yeah. And so success means you've seen something and that gives it kind of a way, you know, you like you see the seam in the rock or or in the build out. And then a raise gives you insight in its purpose. So I guess when you start talking about it like a trap, for example, or a, a hidden door, um, getting that raise would be kind of give you some some additional insight. It may give you a benefit, a plus, right, to yeah. um, now disarm it or – or you know now I know well, just, how just that to detect thing. it, just yeah. to detect it, yeah, yeah. Um, well, this this one's directly taken out of the dwarf from Savage Pathfinder, um, so this again could be a, an ancestry edge, but I do like it as kind of a general thing too. I mean, it really is like you said. It, this is besides stone cutting. This could be like and this could be like a you know the explorer edge too. Like this is for. If you're in dungeons, right? This is where this is where this comes in handy. You're in a dungeon, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and dungeons are usually made of stone, and that's what you're that's what you're there for. So, you know, again, this is another game dependent edge. I think, like, if, if you're not you're not going to get much value out of this outside of, you know, this is a dungeon delving game, or we go into dungeons more than once in the whole game, right? Because a lot of, well, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, but like a lot of games, honestly, fantasy games don't really go to dungeons that much anymore, but. So if you go into like dungeons or ruins or towers, then this is definitely worth it. I think it's cool for the the plus two for traps and hidden doors. Although thief gives you some of it, it it's okay, right? So so just um, keep in mind though, it says in stonework. So this is yeah, valid stonework. in castles. This is valid yeah, in castles, towns that are keeps, made out of stone yeah. and stuff like that. So it, it it has a little bit more utility beyond dungeons, but 
Yeah, I just meant that it's like for places that you're exploring that is like, there, you know, there's hidden dangers or there's secrets, like, you know, so it's kind of when you're like dungeon delving, I, you know, like a t it could be a tower or whatever. Um, you know, I don't know. It, it's really cool. I love the flavor. I think it's cool to have. It definitely could be a sea edge just because it could be very niche depending on whether, you know, your game master likes you. You go and you're exploring like old ruins and stuff that have traps or secret doors, right? Because that's all they're really giving you. Is traps and secret doors. <laughs> stone. Um, yeah, stone traps and secret doors. So stone. Doors. But yeah. if you're in a lot of them, then, you know, it could be a B, I guess. But I would probably say it's a C edge. But I still think, you know, I still think it's cool to have. Uh, I can definitely, as a character, I could definitely take this, even though it's C. Um, okay. Uh, anything else to talk about or you want to move on? Nope, because you roll okay. right into another trap. Uh, trap sense. Yeah. Uh, this one also needs, they both need a repair of D6. This one's seasoned. Okay. This does, this is taken out of the rogue. Class Edge Tree um, from Savage Pathfinder. This one does three things mainly. Um, it basically says you get a free... So I'm just going to talk about it, what it does, and then I'll break something down. But they get a notice roll anytime a detectable trap is about to be sprung within five inches of them. They have to have line of sight of it, line of sight, and they can't be shaken or stunned. This generally works like the danger sense. Oh, that's the one I was thinking of, the danger sense for, uh, for um, Scout. Anyways, <laughs> uh, but it only applies to mechanical and magical traps. I don't really know what other types of traps there are. Oh, I think maybe like a pet trap maybe wouldn't be considered mechanical. Anyways, um, if the trap is detected and may be evaded, so real quickly, traps, there's a whole trap section. They'll, it's, traps will have things like um, um, if, it ha if it can be noticed and what the like negative for the notice roll would be, um, right. if it can be evaded and what that negative is. Um, so that's what we talked about. So if it's detected and can be evaded, the rogue and anyone she warns ignores two points of evasion penalties to do so. Because remember, it's an evasion roll. So it's the automatic minus two that any evasions would have. If the trap can't normally be evaded, anyone warned may be evaded at, usual, at the usual minus two penalty. Um, oh, I guess... Oh, okay. So I guess traps themselves have an, an evasion. It'll just be like, you can evade it for just a normal... I guess you don't take that normal negative. It's kind of confusing there. If the trap can't normally be evaded, anyone warned may evade at the usual minus two penalty. So it oh, says you, so if you can ignore if, the minus two. Yeah. Okay, so if you're yeah, invading, yeah, yeah. you don't have the negative okay. penalty. Yeah. If it's something so it you can evade. evade, then you can evade it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it gives you a bonus for disarming traps. Um, you can ignore up to two points of thievery penalties because then the in the trap entries, they'll have like, it takes a minus two, whatever, to uh, disarm that. And obviously this works really well with Thief, which gives you a plus one on thievery checks. Um, and notice... Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So that's three kind of things there. Let's talk about the first thing first. The notice roll anytime a detectable trap is about to be sprung is a little weird. Because all of the traps, except for the two magical traps, um, basically the rules go that like if you're about... Uh, you roll notice for everybody before they actually spring the trap. So it's not just like traps that just don't go off automatically... Uh, the players get to roll notice before it actually gets to go off. So what I'm assuming here, Carl, is that, um, uh, like I said, besides the magical traps, so maybe with the magical traps, they just get to do a notice roll. But besides that, um, I, I think it's like if people fail their notice checks, then the rogue gets to make another notice roll. That's what I would assume that it allows you to do. Because like I said, all the mechanical traps already give you the ability to make a notice roll. So basically that's that's to avoid springing it then if it is about to be sprung, the rogue gets another notice roll to then be able to use that other, the other, the next abilities, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, um, I guess I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Because otherwise, like, it doesn't make, doesn't really have any value, right? Um, so then the second part of the evasion thing, this is really cool. And again, this is only important if your game master, just like stone cutting, um, if, if they like to use a lot of traps. <laughs> you know, if you're going into dungeons and there's a lot of traps, but the, the whole being able to evade it and ignore the penalties, and then always being able to evade it with the minus two is really cool. And then on top of it, you get to disarm traps for a, a minus two penalties, which then works with the thief edge, right? So, uh, I, I again, this is extremely uh, game dependent whether there's traps in your games, right? I mean, again, I would before taking this, like we say, with all kind of dependent things, are there going to be? Are you going to use traps a lot? If it's the game master is like, I don't really bother with that, or it's like. Maybe one dungeon I'll use has it, right? Then but, if, but if you're... Yeah, probably not worth it. I mean, if you're yeah. big into dungeon delving and, and doing like Underdark campaigns and stuff like that, there will be traps. 
Um, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a general trope. So, um, I would think it's, it's useful if you are doing a lot of dungeoneering and going into ancient places, um, for sure. Yep. Yeah. So I, I would give this a B just if, if, if the game master uses traps, I mean, not like all the time even, but like just frequently enough, then this does enough stuff to make it pretty useful for, for that thing. Right. It's still not going to be useful all the time but it's going to be useful for that thing, right? Is that what you kind of right, think? Right, yeah, I mean, th- rate it differently? not all edges have to be useful all the time. I mean, but it's it's good when it's good, right? It's useful when it's useful, for sure. Yeah. Um, and it's more useful than some of the other ones we talked about, which are, like, heavily dependent on whether we're going to use travel at all, right? So yeah, there's, at all. there's yeah, going to be traps at some point, at some time, I think, um, in general. Um, so, okay. Uh, then the next one is Treasure Hunter, this one I feel a little um, a little odd about. Um, so this one I is, hate this one, but yeah, go yeah. On. So the, <laughs> don't give it away. Um, so this okay, one exactly. says, uh, you know, you're good at you know what to look for in piles of gold. It says, and you know, uh, so the whole the net of this is you can roll a smarts to gauge the value of the goods or treasure, or get a basic idea of a magic item's ability. And then they give an example, which says, you know that. That says, oh, you found one thing out, but you didn't find another thing out. Um, not not a big fan of this one. Um, well, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. Oh, yeah, I forgot the last that, thing. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, finally, when the game master rolls for magic items, uh, the treasure can, the treasure hunter can spend a Benny to have them roll again. Which is fortunate that I never roll for magic items. So, therefore, yeah. That's, you have a, yeah. it's kind of useless. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Well, first off, I don't like that it says roll of smarts to gauge. Everything yeah. else in the world is skills, and we only use the attributes for, um, you know, uh, pr- uh, yeah. uh, oh, my God, brain just went blank. Defending, uh, defending against de- things. Defending against things. Um, yeah. You know, and they say that it requires the occult and notice as requirements. So why didn't you yeah. allow their occult role then to be or something like that to to do this? But um, it's just kind of, it, it's, I mean, I guess it, it, it goes again that the game master has to be throwing a lot of treasure at you and say, oh no, you don't know how much that's worth. You found a goblet. Ha ha. Go, go to town, which is what everybody's going to do anyway. They're going to go to town and sell it. So I, I'm not sure. Um, well, he, uh, yeah. I mean, again, there's two parts to this edge. Let's talk about the first part. And this is why I hate it. Is that, like you said, it's smarts, but. Why do you need this at all? Like this Savage Worlds, like whether you think it's like, you know, the simulationist or gameist, whatever. This is such a gameist thing. Like, I, why do you need this to do that? Like the whole point of the occult skill is to, I mean, they add crafting in this, but it's to know about magical stuff. Or if it's treasure, maybe that would be like common knowledge or repair or, you know, wh- why do we need this? Like, would you ever think you would need this edge? Like if somebody is in a game, no. right? You didn't know about this edge, Carl. And somebody was like, uh, I, oh, oh, okay. We got a bunch of gold idols. Like how much are those worth? And you'd be like, okay, roll common knowledge or roll whatever. Right. Or if I was like, okay, I found an item. Like, what does it do? And you were like, okay, well roll a cult, you know, right. Yeah. Um, to figure it out. Right. That's what you probably do. But now because this is here and like, uh, Right. One, maybe one person has it or you know about this and somebody's like, I want to I want to know about what this thing does. Can I roll a cult? And you'd be like, no, you don't have the treasure. <laughs> like, why, why is this here? Like, that's what the occult skill is for. That's what like, what, why do we need like the whole point? Like it's Savage Worlds is such an open skill system. It's such an open system for being narrative and stuff. Like, why do you need this edge? To know what the values of goods are. That's already represented in the skills. And it's a lot more Same fun. It's even about a lot, magic items. It's even a lot more fun for people to play with magic items as part of the narrative to figure stuff out, you know, versus... Have to, like, figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I, I, I just don't see... Like, it's just taking value out of skills. And that's, like, the whole point of those skills are to do those things. So, I that's why that's why I've been saying... This is not even, like, an F edge. Like, I just like, don't even have this there. Like, why is this... It just makes me weird. Like, okay, so I couldn't do that before, you know? Or like, say if one person has treasure hunter, somebody takes this edge and then, but somebody else is like, well, I have a back, I, no, I used to be a merchant or I, I make, I, I have the artificer edge and I make magic items and I have all these power points, but I didn't take treasure hunter, right? 
because uh, my oh. notice is not D8 or whatever. But the person who has Treasure Hunter is like, okay, we, have, we need to figure out what an item does, and they get to roll smart. And then you, as the person who has the Artificer Edge and making all the magic items, doesn't get to roll? No, you, you do know? not. Tough. Too bad. Like, I, yeah, no, get rid of this edge. And the second part, that's okay. If your Game Master's rolling a lot on the... the uh, if the Game Master's rolling a lot for treasure, then that's kind of cool that they can spend Benny to roll again, I guess. But on its own, that's not worth an edge, you know? No. So... I don't know. I, that's why. That's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't even like that. So, so I really there, don't like. So there are a lot of I, game masters. Away from, yeah. Are there a lot of game masters who roll for magic items? That seems like you're just asking for trouble. I, you know, well, the magic item exists or it doesn't exist. It's not the Schrodinger's well, that, that's, magic that's item. The, well, that's the thing with, um, yeah. I mean, it's a little bit different. Savage Pathfinder, but we talk about it. I talk about this in the comparison video. Um, the, the way they've done, they've done their treasure system. Why there's set like wondrous um items like you know whatever a dog that can be summoned i don't remember all the specific ones in this book they're set wondrous items everything else is on rollable tables and while in savage pathfinder i believe it was like availability a lot of the rolls this it's just like what do you get and it's based on like wealth um so yeah like everything is just like unrollable tables so like uh, a jewelry and or like a, a you know sword that just has plus well one. yeah i, I all understand rolls. even a d and d v1 the original edition had rollable tables for treasure you don't have to roll uh, rolling on no, them is a cop out roll. it's a cop out it's like yeah it's the magic item should match the narrative or match it exists for a reason it's not just randomly there yeah right? so uh, I, but yeah, i get anyway. it though i i I don't think it's a cop out. Like, personal I get opinion. It. Sometimes you personal just, opinion. Sometimes you, sometimes you don't want to like necessarily tailor things, or you just want to be like, okay, what is, what what is, what is in this treasure chest, and I'll just roll really quickly to see what it is. Like, I get that, right? But yeah, I, I don't think it's. This is an F edge. Take it out of the game. I hate it because I don't like what it does to the rest of the game. And why does it take away that? You know, I don't know. I don't like it at all. All right. Sorry. Whew. Okay. No, we don't <laughs> like this Moving on. One. Yeah, we to don't the like final this one. one, Troubadour. So Troubadour uh, also was in uh, Savage Pathfinder. Um, you need a common knowledge of D6 performance of a D8. This basically gives you plus two on most common knowledge rolls because you've been around the bush. Again, here's GM's call, but okay, that's weird to put that in there. The main <laughs> point of this, though, is that you can use performance in place of battle for leadership edges or edges that require battle. Uh, this is a really, really cool edge. This is very specific. And if you're using the Bard... Um, there's a Bard AP in this book, which is basically the same as the Pathfinder one. It's very powerful to get this. Um, so this is a really... I don't think this is overpowered. I would say if you're a Bard, this is probably an A edge um, because you could then leverage all the leadership stuff and just have one skill that does everything. Otherwise, um, I, I like that it does what flavor-wise is that you can be the leader, but like you're just kind of leveraging the performance side of it. I mean, even, even if you're not a magical Bard... Um, it's still really, really good because performance can be used for a lot of supporting edges. And then you can use stuff like Inspire with performance. Now, there was a big thing of a question whether you can use Inspire with Troubadour and Work the Room that I never got an answer from. But I'm just going to assume you just can't use those together because they're separate things, right? Um, but still, I think this is A or a B, depending on if you have the arcane background or not. Um, just because it kind of it makes performance just the one skill you can just specifically, this is for specific builds. You can use performance and just do everything. Obviously you have to, you get, you, you have to want to use leadership edges to get into this. So, um, otherwise, so that's all, it's only good for that. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's it's same from having a split, split your yeah. skill points between two things to per, be able to get that, that yeah. benefit. Yeah, for sure. So it's a, for a very specific type of character. <laughs> otherwise, you know, that's a lot of, you have to do a lot of support edges and a lot of leadership edges to get value out of this. So, um, otherwise don't take it. I mean, it's not like can rate it, right? Um, right. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? No, I, I, I just throw in what I was, what I was thinking. It okay. really gives you that benefit of not having to split your skill points to, to, to do those other things that you want to do. And so it's, if you're in that performance, if you're the bardish kind of character, for sure. Yeah. So, Okay. Now we're into social edges, and it uses the plural, but there's only one new one, um, <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that is deceptive, um, and this is where you're all about lying and deceiving and providing you know, misdirection, um, and it's, the whole point is when you're testing using a smarts or spirit-linked skill, you choose whether to target resists with smarts or spirit, which I think is yeah. pretty useful. 
um, because people don't always, um, you know, I know Savage World doesn't have dump stats, but people do will tend to have one of those lower than the other. Um, mm-hmm. And you can take advantage of that um, for a test um, that's that has those linked um, those linked skills. So what do you what are you thinking about this one? I, I like it. I, I don't know if I'd call it an A or, but it's you know good solid B in my opinion. Yeah. Um. So I mean we've talked a lot. You can check out our um, test video. We talk all about tests, and I love that they've included this. This should be a, again. Here's one of the base Savage World edges. I think should be in there, along with Trick Trick Shot. Which is so faint does this originally, which is uh, if you do a fighting attack as a test, you can choose to switch it with smarts instead of just using agility. And then Trick Shot does that with range attacks. Now this is here for smarts, for taunt or for intimidation, basically. Those are the main kind of smarts and spirit based edges. But it's this deceptive is not going to be as powerful uh, of an option as Trick Shot or Faint because those allow you to choose between a physical and a and smarts, which generally generally I mean you know. A lot of your creatures might all have D6s, right, Carl? But a, but not always, right? There's some that are going to have higher physical stats or higher mental stats, depending on what they are. This is kind of choosing between spirits and smart, which is much harder to know about. Like, if you have a big dumb fighter coming at you, right, you're going to want to use smarts to test them, for them to use smarts instead of agility. That's what faint does, right? So this is not going to be, like you said, it's not as strong. It's not an A. It's definitely not an A. But I love that it's here because I said edges like this, if you're doing a test-based thing, um, this, you know, this brings up the, what, when we talk about our tests, I almost think fighting and fighting and shooting now, especially now can almost be better than intimidation for tests. Although, you know, in some ways, but intimidation has the, like, you can do uh, multiples at once with work, uh, with, I forget what it's called, but yeah, anyway, anyways, yeah, this is a B, this is a B for me just because it does increase it, but it almost could be even a C just because, like I said, it's really hard to know, okay. Is this well, person better at spirits or smarts? I, I, I think. How can you tell that? Well, I you know? think as a game master, if somebody's taken this, um, it's just, it's it's just this. Maybe you should let give them a clue, <laughs> a little bit, so that they can pick the best. Yeah, one. yeah, you know. I, I would um, think with with this one, you're if you're if you're using intimidation, which is, uh, you know, taunt taunt has a very specific build. Intimidation could be more strong just because of menacing. Um, and you can get free rules anyways for both of them, so that that's not a big deal. Um, then using using intimidation for smarts is probably a good a good thing because a lot of spirits generally a higher stat because it's more defensible. But if it's like a bookish person, then obviously smarts would be higher. So that's what I'm saying. It's a little bit harder to to leverage this than trick shot or faint. So for me, it's either a C or a B depending on what you're kind of doing with your builds. But still good to have. I think it's a necessary edge. Okay. Um, okay, moving on to weird edges. We're getting to the final stretch now. Um, Aura of Courage, which needs Spirit of D8. This was taken directly out of Paladin. Basically, it gives you a always-on 10-inch aura uh, that gives you plus one to fear checks and subtracts one from the fear table. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's good for the group. Again, this is very campaign-specific. Uh, are you going to be against a lot of things that have fear checks? You know, a lot of games don't have them. If you're playing a Deadlands, that'd be good to have, right? Um, there's already g- good ones for yourself. So, um, you know, technically, this doesn't apply to yourself, which I think it should. I think if somebody takes Aura of Courage, they should have this. But I guess there's already edges that give you a plus one and subtract from the fear table. So, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you make everybody else brave, but not yourself. So, <laughs> And it's within 10, inch, 10 inches, like... I think this works really good with if you are going into having like uh, extras, right? Yeah. With you, like yeah. allied extras. This is probably the better. This is probably where I would consider taking it if you're if you're leveraging your leadership edges. Then I would take this, um, and that's actually really good because if you're against. But again, you have to have a game that has a lot of fear based enemies, right? Yeah. Like I, I don't know. So how much besides Deadlands? How many enemies have you used that uses fear? Really, one or two, a couple times I can remember out of all. Yeah, the games. I, I, it's again, it's it's very setting a line like um when we were doing deadlands lost colony fear was a much bigger deal and it's yeah. the deadlands universe but um yeah it, it, it's a definitely it's a depends it's a depends one with the fear so okay um next we have beast talker which is a 
rather odd. So I guess it's good that it's in the weird edges, but it's kind of a strange, <laughs> strange little thing. So the whole point of this one is as a character, you can speak to kind of a kind of animal. Like, you know, uh, the examples they give is like birds, marine animals, um, which is kind of weird because there's really different classes of marine animals as well, right? But um, insects, mammals, you can't control them. You can't really have a necessarily a big conversation with them um, because it's the comprehension might be limited by the creature. Um, so the example they give is a dog knows and understands far more than a fish. Okay, that's good. Dogs are smarter than fish, but what about dolphins? Come on, people. Uh, that's not a so, fish. <laughs> so that's the, not a fish, Carl. Well, they said marine animals. They did so, say marine animals. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that's where I was saying that there's different kinds of marine animals. But anyway, so see, you caught you caught where I was saying. You caught what I was saying. There, yeah, so. but they list mammals separately. So I guess, you know, yeah, you'd probably want, even in an aquatic game, you'd probably want mammals over Marine animals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, so yeah, it's, I, it's I, interesting, I, yeah. but it's all flavor. It's, you know, in the sense that, you know, you can, you can, I mean, I Walt Disney it um, to talk to the different yeah. animals and get some information. Uh, yeah, I love the flavor of this. This is definitely a flavor edge. I mean, there's utility here, of course. It helps with a lot of like investigation or for scouting or, again, you have to persuade them. They're not going to go out of their way, but they might help you, especially if you use, like, you know, give you some berries or whatever. Um, <laughs> some but here's berries. the thing. Like, I always <laughs> love this ability in any type of tabletop games. I love druidy characters, so I always love being able to talk to animals, and having it always on is really cool. But I think in practice, it, you know, what I found myself is that it always seems better in your mind than what you actually get use out of. So I would probably say here, just let them talk to all animals. Like, why not? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Right, Carl? Like, I, I mean, maybe you think differently, but I think... You know, why not? Let them talk to animals. Like, just get let them talk to all animals. It's, right. it's an edge. I mean, they could take the mount edge in, in place of this. I don't know. Like, <laughs> they could take an arcane background. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. again, we're not always comparing everything. It's not apples to apples, but I don't know. That's my opinion is let them speak to all animals. And then, you know, just for flavor, for flavor, if they can do that, then to me, it's like an A. An A for flavor, right? I, I think for those type of characters. But, you know, in, in practice... It's generally, like you said, it's a, it's a flavor edge. So let them. T I, that's that's. I know. What do you think? Like no, I, I think animals. I like to change to say it's more just like, how about a phylum of animals? Um, you know, maybe you can talk yeah. to animals, but you can't talk to insects or something like that. You know, but yeah, but I like, like that. land animals. Yeah, yeah, have have a bigger, broader capability to. Um, be able to, to interact with them and leverage leverage it. I mean, you're taking this edge, so you want at some point to be able to talk to the guard dog and now know how many, you know, tap your heel, how many guys came through, choosh, 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 whatever, right? Um, you want yeah. to take advantage of that at some point. So, yep. And here's another one that doesn't say you can take it more than once, but I think that's dumb. Like, you should be able to take it more than once. Again, like a druid is going to want to talk to all animals. And I guess they could take the beast, the beast, uh, the power, uh, beast, ma uh, whatever I forget the name. Beast, ma <laughs> beast talker, beast speaker, I beast friends. There, there you go. Beast, beast friends. Friend. Yeah. Where they can kind of communicate with them, although it's always weird. Of like, you control them and communicate them. Did you have to control them to be able to talk to them? I don't know. So, yeah. Like I said, you, you need to up this a little bit, but it's cool. Okay. Final weird edge. Rapid change. This has to do with lycanthropy. So again. Only take this if you have lycanthropy and you're under lycanthropy. So that's we're going to rate it as such. Um, so normal lycanthropy. You, well, it is you, a requirement. You, 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 it yeah, it's a requirement. So, yeah, obviously. Uh, um, so when you're cursed with it and at the full moon you change and then you have to make like a, I forget what it is, like a smarts roll or spirit roll at a minus two. And if you succeed after your, your change at a full moon, then you then you gain the ability to be able to change at will. And you get through, you have your normal form, you have a animal form, which is a dire animal version of you. So if it's like a dire wolf or a dire bear um, from the from the, the base theory, um, or there's a hybrid, which gives you like a bunch of stuff that's pretty powerful. So I would say if you have lycanthropy and you want to keep your lycanthropy, then this is required. This is A. This is this is A. Just because, have to have it. It's just it's because just if you're, you know, yeah. combat breaks out and you want to be able to change then this does it as a limited action. It's required. Required. So if you if you have the character and you want this, 
you have to take it. I mean, that's all there is to say, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's. I, I don't think it's it's. I mean, Lycanthropy is already pretty powerful on its own, so this allows you just to do it as a limited action. Um. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't call it specifically an S, but it's an A, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Okay, so that brings us now to the final legendary edges. Um, so the first one we have is home ground, which is basically you've got, um, you know, your home turf, and that could be a forest for a druid. It could be a tower for the wizard. You know, it could be anything, but it's all, all right, about... Read the last one. I love the last one. A necromancer in the ruined city his undead horde has built for him. Sorry. I think that one is so, so edgy and cool. But <laughs> the necromancer. They're always so edgy yeah. with their with their undeads running around and zombies. And yeah. <laughs> and they get a city. They get a city that, they're, uh, that their zombie construction workers have built for them. Well, anyway, it, says, it says, you know, one of the things, you got to work with the game master to designate, yeah. designate an area as your hero's home. And so this could be an entire forest. Maybe it's not an entire city. Maybe it's just, you know, the bad part of town. I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be up to you and the game master. Now, this is a legendary. So obviously it's pretty powerful in what it does. So basically one of the cool things I think is, you know, while you're once per encounter, you can spend a Benny and recover all your power points. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, that's, Spend yeah. a Benny and then you get all your power points. Now, remember, you're legendary, so you already have a sh crap ton of power points probably by now. And you're like blowing through them in an encounter and just because you've also by now taken epic modifiers, right? So you're yeah. so you're like spending a lot of points to do a lot of, you know, do a lot. And then you just spend a Benny and you get all those power points back as long as you're on your home turf. Um, so this is something great for the bad guys to have, to be honest, but uh, you could have done that anyway. Um, and then uh, and then there's a couple of other things. Um, uh, they you can, have they also sense. get a sense of their home. Yeah, yeah you get yeah, a home sense. get a sense of their home, uh, uh, no matter how distant you are. So you can know like what's going on in there, basically. And it says you can concentrate for 10 minutes or a minute if it's on their home ground to ask three questions about the current observable state. So basically you just get to know what's going on in there. Yeah. So it's your, um, it's your, yeah. uh, your ring doorbell for your home turf. <laughs> yeah, basically. <exactly. laughs> yeah. Magic ring. <laughs> uh, yeah, this one is obviously again, pure flavor. He, here's, I guess here's a reason why, again, this could be similar to like treasure hunter in a way of like, well, you're legendary and I'm a, I'm a legendary druid. I'm an arc druid. Here's my, this is my forest that I've decided like, this is my forest. And you're like, okay, cool. Like you don't need this edge to actually have like, this is my forest. But this gives you specific mechanical benefits. That yeah, are like it's the mechanics that make the difference. That. Yeah. So I, wh while, you know, I think you could still have your home ground without this edge, this gives you those mechanical benefits. Now, is it that strong? I mean, not really, but just because, well, yeah, all your power points are good. It has to be within your place. And like, how often, honestly, let's like, honestly, how often is something you're going to be hanging out and something's going to be happening there? Well, um, that's why like, I said it's know. great for the bad guys. So your your bad, bad guy guys. wild cards, yeah. this would be a great legendary edge for them to have home ground. Just think it's about, true. just think about that battle, when it's like yeah. the Benny go. Your characters are like going and going back and forth, and the game master just tossed out a Benny and go. Oh, I have all my power points back. My turn. Yeah. <laughs> and I, again, you need you need to have an arcane background for this. I don't know if we talked about it. It's not just for like a fighter. It's, you have to have magic, otherwise it doesn't make sense thematically, right? Um, so you can't be like the the knight that then has like the non magical you know lord that has just a castle or whatever. You have to actually have magic. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I think flavor wise, it's awesome. I, I think if I was legendary and you're playing the game into, into legendary, then this is something that I would even could take. Even though you know, again, I mean, if you take this, then your game master might okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna attack them in their home ground <laughs> because they took this edge. But you know, honestly. it's mechanically I'd rate this as a C, but I give this an A for flavor. And I would probably take this as a legendary character, especially if I was like a druid. Um, I mean, like I had a druid in a game. And this is something that also that you're, that you're, um, you know, that I can see your, even people who didn't have arcane backgrounds, I can see your game master just giving this to everybody. Like, like you guys all have your, like you guys are legendary. You guys are basically demigods or whatever. Like you, you Everybody gets this at an advance, like, you know, instead of an advance right now, everybody just gets this or whatever. I don't know. I can see that. So really cool for flavor, right? Um, okay. 
Anything else to say or? Nope. Nope. Okay. Uh, Relic. Uh, um, this is legendary and it just says powerful items normally through quests, but you just get this, I guess. Uh, it just says if opportunity. If, if you don't, if you didn't get it, then you can take this edge to then get a any one magical item from the book. And if the game master must approve the choice as usual, deciding if the thing even exists in their world. And if so, the hero comes upon it somehow, perhaps via a, a inheritance at the end of the next quest, or as a gift from they've aided. If they've lost, he eventually recovers and replaces this. So we're going to compare this to heirloom, which kind of did the same thing, which is a novice edge. But it was any magic item within 10,000 gold pieces. Um, and if it was destroyed at that time, then you didn't get it back. Now, we did not like that edge at all. Um, but, you know, I guess if this is a game where, like, your Game Master never gave you anything. Although I could still think, like, I want this item. And then your Game Master was like, okay, let's do a mini quest of you. Like, let's do a dramatic task of you getting this item or something. I don't know. But I guess I if they're really stingy, then this is a good way to get it. But again, it's always it's all up to your game master. It's up to the game master. <laughs> so if they're so if they're stingy, then it it obviously doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's a weird one. I again, I, I don't like this. Right? I don't think you like it because it's kind of forcing this, and it's like you can do all this anyways with narrative things and with role playing and stuff. So I yeah, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't like this edge. So. I mean, getting a relic should be part of the narrative anyway. You know, they're just kind of randomly now yeah. i've got some so uh, anyway but not my favorite so yeah not my favorite i i mean is it powerful yeah i mean depending on the item i mean i haven't gone through all the magic items but if you didn't have a your you know plus three whatever fire scythe uh <laughs> then yeah uh but you know, that's blade? good to get that's good. And you can never, and you can like, it only takes a session or two for it to come back to you. Like, that's good. But I don't think it should be, I don't think it should be here. Like, I don't think it should be. No, I, I don't, I don't, okay. I don't like that one either. Only so, two more. <laughs> uh, and then we have unstoppable, uh, yeah. which is the hero is, um, you know, a, they say a force of nature an irresistible force. I mean, basically it's exactly what it says. You get the unstoppable monstrous ability, which, um, so that, that basically means is is whenever you take damage, you can only okay. ever have a maximum of one wound at a time. Yeah, that that is the unstoppable monstrous ability. So, um, and and if, if the thing attacking you had a Joker, then it ignores it. And then it also talks about like weaknesses. But if you're a player character, you don't have weaknesses or whatever. So, um, yeah, yep. you know, it needs a lot of requirements, right? Vigor D10, Iron oh, Jaw, tons, Steel. tons of requirements. Um. Yeah, this is an A edge. I mean, if you're legendary, this is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. Only getting by the time you're legendary, and if you're a tanky character, which you probably are, if you have Iron Jaw and Nerves of Steel, right? Only getting one wound at a time. <laughs> I mean, I mean that depends on your bennies, right? If you're running out of bennies, so you can't soak anymore. Um, but you probably have ways to ignore wound penalties, right? Like this is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful because most things are going to ace and give you a lot of damage when thing, you know. So. This is an A edge, right? Yeah, I, know, oh, I totally agree. Thoughts? I totally agree. Um, yeah, that unstoppable right. monstrous yeah. ability is pretty is pretty sweet. Now that is yeah. that is added here in the fantasy companion. Yeah. Um, so. All right. All right. Uh, last final one. edge. All right, warband. So you need um, command and at least two other leadership edges. You need the followers, which I believe followers edge is also a legendary edge in normal suede, right? Uh, let me look it up real Actually, quick. Actually, I don't know. I think it is. Um, but... I'm pretty sure, yeah, Followers is a legendary edge. So you need another legendary edge to get this. Um, and that what basically Followers allows you to do. Now, Followers is always kind of a weird edge anyways, because like often you, if you're in a game where you're having legendary, you know, if you have uh, leadership edges, you're, you're gaining ex allied extras anyways through role playing. But Followers is you get five Followers and they always are repaired. So it is actually good to get. It's still a really good edge if you have, if you're going into the leadership tree. Like, you always will have these five extra people. But that's, you know, that could be annoying for game masters who don't like a lot of extras. Anyways, so you have five people. Warband, what does it do? Each time the edge is taken, so you can take this more than once, <laughs> uh, <laughs> five of the champion's followers gains the resilience monstrous ability. Uh, what basically resilient does is it allows them to take one wound. Yep. So, you know, if you're going with leadership edges and you took the follower's edge... Then this is excellent. 
I mean, this is an A edge then. I mean, giving them resilient is extremely po is extremely powerful. Um, and you could do it for, you know, if you have 10 or 15, although I don't know what Game Master would let you have 20 fucking, sorry, <laughs> swear there, 20 extras. <laughs> uh, that's a lot, right? In combat, but... Um, by the time you get to... By the time Maybe you get to that roles. size, it's time to do mass battles if you're starting to get yeah. <laughs> Or you just do group roles. But, you know, yeah, if you're yeah. already doing that, then getting them resilient is extremely important. So this is, you know, if you, this is, you need to take this if you, if you're already doing that. It's my opinion. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I mean, if you've gone, if you've made that kind of investment, you might as well take this step and get the resilient. I mean, why not? Right. Yeah, totally. Totally agree there. Yeah. Woo. All right. Well, that was uh, that was a marathon. Um, yeah, a lot of a lot of really good information there. Um, so I don't know. Is there any last thoughts? Otherwise, I'll close this one off. Oh, yeah. I think last thoughts. I think like I think we talked about it at the beginning of our now sec first video that we made on these. Um, there's a there's a lot of cool edges in here. There's a lot of edges that I think um, should be in normal suede. Um, just for normal games, non-fantasy games. Um, you know, there's some in there that I don't like. There's some of the hindrances that I don't uh, like, but there's good hindrances too. So overall, I think the value here is strong, even if you don't um, want to play fantasy games. I think a lot of the stuff in here is good for any game. So I mean, overall, I think they did a really good job. This added a lot of stuff that you, you would want to, you know, branch out these type of flavors that you want to get for characters. Obviously, I think some of these in here are too strong, or much stronger than the normal book, and should be capped a little bit. But otherwise, I think overall, you know, good job. Uh, what are your final thoughts, Carl? I I think um, it's a all these edges and and the character creation and the pieces is just yet another reason why you just absolutely have to buy the fantasy companion yeah. and have it on your shelf with um, with suede. Um, some of the edges we just think should be part of the core book. Um, and there's a lot of them, like you said, there's a few that need to be nerfed just a little tad. Um, but overall balance is pretty good. Um, there's, there's some that is like, well, why would you bother with it? But if it's the kind of game you're playing and it makes sense, then yeah. some of those edges are valuable. So, I mean, overall, um, fantasy companion is just a fantastic book. And, and these first couple of videos on character creation and edges and hindrances, uh, just kind of demonstrates that I think. Yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, <laughs> thanks much for for listening. This is uh, probably the second of two, um, so I don't know how I'm going to cut these apart. But uh, appreciate everybody everybody listening. <laughs> uh, this is again tabletop tango with Eric and Carl here. And uh, look at the bubbles. If you made it this far, you have to look at the bubbles and subscribe. Yeah, You've made it this far. You have to just subscribe. Um, I've cast puppet on you, and I've forcing you to, to look at the bubbles <laughs> and to click things. <laughs> you must do it. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Once again, Tabletop Tango, thank you much, and we'll catch you in the next video. Happy gaming. Oh.